My name is Daniel, and please enjoy a little ghostly history from Niagara-on-the-Lake, a small town near Canada's wonder of the world, Niagara Falls. Considered by many to be Canada's most haunted town, a long history, violence, and way too many haunting stories to fit here, all proving it's a ghostly place. Upper Canada's original capital was home to many firsts for Ontario. The first library, courthouse, post office, pharmacy, newspaper, Freemason Lodge, church, and of course, public executions by hanging. Leading to a little known first, the one and only time in Canadian history when a woman was hanged, the charge poisoning her husband. This history reads like a soap opera. A young woman named Mary London, forced to marry an older man. He's rich, owns a farm located at the head of the lake, area now part of the city of Hamilton. It's said Mary fell in love with a farmhand named George. Together they planned her husband Bartholomew's murder. The method? Poison. It said George had to travel to the United States to get it, as Canadian apothecaries didn't sell poisonous liquid to regular citizens. Bart died. Mary was found out. Her and George arrested and kept in a small stone jailhouse once at King and Byron in Niagara-on-the-Lake. Their love so strong, not really. Each turned on each other, pointing fingers the other way. The court's unable to determine who planned and orchestrated the murder to make sure Mary and George were hanged side by side. To read the full story, which I highly recommend, Google Mary London. There's a Canadian biography page based on her. Much was accomplished in the short time on this former native land, all starting with a loyalist named Colonel John Butler, along with his men, families, all settling the area, naming it Butlersburg, later to be called Newark, Niagara, and finally Niagara-on-the-Lake. Loyalist is a simple term, meaning staying loyal to the British crown, a bad thing in the late 1700s while living in the United States. These British men, women, and kids fled the American Revolution, going into a British territory named Upper Canada to keep their loved ones safe. Upper Canada is now the province of Ontario, location of cities like Toronto, Ottawa, and Hamilton. Coming here for a new life, they would meet up with its native inhabitants. Natives called that land home for over 10,000 years, part of the Neutral Nation, a tribe of natives once spanning along the shores of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie named neutral by settlers who believe them to be a peaceful group. At its height, the nation is believed to have reached 12,000 people. They occupied these lands for over 500 years, eventually destroyed by smallpox and invading tribes. It's the neutrals who provided the name Niagara. While settled in the town, their village was called Niagara, meaning neck of land. It sounded like Niagara to settlers. The Mississauga tribe held the lands when Loyalist John Butler arrived with his men. They met with the natives in 1781. The town was purchased for the British, and in return the Mississaugas received a ridiculous payment. 300 suits of clothing. As some historians are quoted, they were ripped off, and I agree. In 1782, 16 families started Butlersburg. Just 10 years later, it was renamed Newark by Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe. 
he created big plans for the strategically located land. Newark was to become the first capital of British Canada. Didn't last long though. Just five parliament sessions over three years. However, it included one of the most important created laws in Canadian history. When slavery was outlawed, one of the first laws of its kind in all the world, sort of. They didn't actually end slavery in a single swoop. Instead, they created guidelines to phase it out, starting with any newly arriving slaves to be freed immediately. Also, the children of current slaves were free, and current slaves, however, not free. It's rumored after the decision, government officials retired to a pub called the Harmonious Coach House for a drink. The Coach House eventually became the Angel Inn after the War of 1812. Still stands as Ontario's oldest restaurant and inn, and now one of the town's most haunted locations, a feature stop on the ghost walks. And then in 1796, the capital was moved a less vulnerable to attack land called York. Today it is called Toronto. Good move, because on May 27th in 1813, as the War of 1812 raged, Americans marched into Niagara-on-the-Lake. After Canada's best general Isaac Brock fell at Queenston Heights, the American reformed to attack via Lake Ontario. Later, the town's barracks at Fort George were burned. 5,000 Americans defeated 1,000 British. The Americans held the town for seven months until December 10, 1813. The tides of war turned with an upset defeat in Stony Creek, a small town now part of the city of Hamilton. With a head of steam, the British advanced on their former capital Remaining American soldiers and treasonous Brits decided not to fight, but while leaving, they burned Niagara-on-the-Lake to the ground. Not for anger, but strategy. To deny the Brits shelter during a very cold winter, most every building and structure destroyed. All that survived were the McFarlane House, half of Brockamore Manor because the fire went out, and the building housing ammunitions in Fort George because they didn't want to blow themselves up. Some wooden houses were left for innocent residents to huddle. After the War of 1812 moved into the United States, as mentioned in the ghostly history of the White House, people rebuilt. That's why so many structures do not predate 1814. Most towns have haunted locations attached to history. Simple tragedies and events normal for any place. Niagara-on-the-Lake is different. The only war fought on Canadian soil affected this town like no other. Death, violence, and tragedy afflicting a small place with history spanning almost 300 years. And don't forget about the natives. This type of energy as a confined space is unique. A town of about 20,000 people with so much history, two ghost walks, and a published book just about the ghosts, confirming to so many why this is Canada's most haunted town. History is the foundation of ghosts. The stories of war told often, how they interact with the living today, causing this town to rightly receive a reputation of having more ghosts than living. The stories just don't stop, and if told, this would be way too long for everyone. For this reason, I'll focus on a couple of legendary town ghosts, the amazing story of Sobbing Sophia and a protective spirit. Sobbing Sophia was the love of the great British general Isaac Brock, Canada's most important strategist during the war. Some are unaware, but he didn't want to begin Canada. The Americans chose the year 1812 for a reason. They knew the main British soldiers were occupied fighting Napoleon in Europe. Brock was a main British general who wanted to remain in that war, but the Brits didn't want to lose their territory and Canada needed a leader. At the time, the Powell family lived in a house called Brockamore Manor, today a bed and breakfast you can stay in. 
Sophia Shaw was Captain Powell's sister-in-law who lived with the family. Isaac Brock was stationed at Fort George when legend states he met and fell in love with Sophia. Their courtship quick due to tragic times, and not long before talking about their future, marriage, family, and kids. But Sophia's father, Aeneas Shaw, was against it. He knew Brock was important for Canada, however the general wasn't from noble blood. Brock didn't come from money and couldn't afford the best for his beloved daughter. Aeneas denied Isaac permission to marry Sophia. This didn't stop them. Then in October of 1812, Isaac Brock was summoned to join his men and defend Queenston Heights. If lost, this would give the Americans an easy march into Niagara on the lake. Sophia didn't know it, but it would be the last time she'd see him. At Queenston Heights, the Americans had the hill. Brock charged his men up into a heavy assault. This scared some of the British who dropped back, and Brock saw this yelling out, This is the first time I've seen the 49th turn their backs. It worked. The men surged. Brock was first shot in the wrist, but it didn't slow him. Possibly a distraction, though. He didn't see the soldier emerge from the bushes about 50 yards away. It was an American sniper who lined up and fired, hit Brock square in the chest. Lay dying on that field surrounded by his men, it said his final words were, push on. Probably not true, but it sounds great. The great general was dead. His men retrieved the body, pulling him away and down a hill as blood spread across a bright red sash given to him by famous native Shawnee warrior Tecumseh. Sophia was told her beloved had died. She mourned for years, refused to marry, always wondering what could have been, and then dying at a young age, many believe from a broken heart. During her final years, the people of Niagara on the Lake didn't see Sophia, but they did hear her. Cries coming from the open second story window of the Brockamore Manor House, eventually calling her sobbing Sophia, and she still heard today. Reports of a woman crying in that room. Others hear her along the town's main strip, Queen Street. And then we have what's called the Watcher. A strange blue light, or an orb, seen floating the streets at night, near the modern post office across from Starbucks. Legend states it's a former constable, hence the blue light, like the police. No one sees it long enough to investigate, just a quick glimpse before it's gone. No following emotions or figure hiding in the shadow. Believed to be a protective energy, watching the town at night while the residents sleep. We've reached the end. This has been a ghostly history of Canada's most haunted town, Niagara-on-the-Lake. Don't agree it's the most haunted? Tell us why below. Ghosts make history just that much better. Thanks for watching.